In Doctor Who fandom, the term Doctor Light refers to stories where the Doctor has a minimal physical presence within the narrative. The story takes place in the Doctor Who universe and often features other Doctor Who characters, but the Doctor is mostly a no-show. For television, this idea was often a way to work around scheduling limitations. In a few episodes of the serial The Celestial Toymaker, the Doctor is made completely invisible because William Hartnell went on vacation. In New Who, the episodes where the Doctor barely appeared meant you could film two episodes at once and save on production time. Now, a lot of these episodes turned out pretty good. One of the New Who's most popular episodes is Blink, and that's a Doctor Light story. But it is creativity brought about by limitation. But what if you didn't have that limitation? What if you weren't restrained by budget or time or your lead actor going to the beach for the weekend? What reason might you have to write a Dr. Light story then? And what might it look like? Well, The Virgin New Adventures is about to find out. This is Birthright by Nigel Robinson. Something has gone wrong with the TARDIS. Its three occupants have been thrown across time and space. Professor Bernice Summerfield finds herself in London in 1909, the TARDIS exterior disconnected from its timeship interior, now just a slowly rotting wooden box. It's not all bad. It seems the doctor set up lodging and money ahead of time for any one of his friends who might find themselves in this place and time period, but things are never simple, as the city is being terrorized by horrifying murders. Women dismembered in the streets, the killer vanishing, a smell of ammonia lingering in the air. Has Jack the Ripper returned? Is Spring Hill Jack more than just a legend? Benny gets wrapped up in things after meeting Mikhail Popov, a Russian detective who has connected the London murders with similar murders in St. Petersburg, murders that claimed his daughter Natasha. Together, they find a connection to the Brotherhood of the New Dawn, a secret society of mystics led by Jared Kahn, a mysterious man who seems to have some idea as to what the TARDIS is. 20,000 years in the future, on the wasteland planet of Atacon, Ace is trying to figure out what to do as she stays with the local hairy humanoids. The problem is that these people are being rounded up as food for the Charl, an insectoid race that once reigned as one of the universe's greatest civilizations, but are now a shell of their former selves. Ace plans to lead a revolt against the Charl and save those they've captured, but in doing so discovers a plot involving the Queen of the Charl and Moldwitch a strange little man from the mountains who seems to know a thing or two about time travel. Somehow, separated by Millennium, these two plots are woven tightly together, and it's up to Benny and Ace to reunite and save two worlds. And they'll have to do it alone, because the Doctor is nowhere to be seen. Actually, to be more specific, the Doctor's having a Cyberman adventure in the book Iceberg, which we'll get to next time. Yeah, the Virgin New Adventures was trying out an experiment. Two books by different authors happening in parallel with each other, one with a doctor all by his lonesome, and the other with the companions having to do the heavy lifting themselves. It's a very interesting experiment. The first time Dr. Light and Companion Light stories were really explored for their own sake, and not just because Fraser Hines had chickenpox and Jamie had to be magically recast into a different actor for one episode of The Mind Robber. Man, classic Doctor Who production was just hanging on by a thread. So. From a creative angle, what does it mean for the Doctor to not be present in a Doctor Who story? Well, in this case, it means showing off what Bernice Summerfield can do as a lead. This marked the eighth book featuring Benny as a major character, though many of the earliest ones hadn't been written with her in mind, having her either playing a role meant for Ace or being mostly sidelined. It was only now that writers were getting used to her being there, and having a story where Benny does all the heavy lifting would be a good test run to see how well this character has been realized and help future writers further define her. So how well does it work? Really well. Bernice Summerfield slots in nicely as story lead in a way that is both complementary but distinct to how the Doctor acts as the lead. Benny has many of the same advantages the Doctor has. She's intelligent, from a spacefaring future that gives her insights into advanced technology and alien races. 
She has a working knowledge of Earth history, which lets her get around while time traveling. She's a wonderfully anachronistic element that upsets the balance of things. How she differs from the Doctor, or more specifically the Seventh Doctor, is a complete disregard to having a plan or being in complete control of a situation. Betty is a con artist who faked her way into a career in academia, a borderline alcoholic and just a bundle of nerves in general. She is so not in control that she can't even keep her awful phony accents in check. Donna Inn? Leave off, mate. We ain't Donna Inn, Mandy retorted, reverting to her fake London accent, which, if she had been using it consistently, might have just gained her some credibility with the crowd. As it was, it just increased their distrust. Take a butcher's at her. She's breathing, ain't she? Popov looked curiously at Benny. There was something very odd, and indeed in any other circumstances rather charming, about this lady who acted in the most unladylike fashion he had ever imagined, and who switched accents the way he thought only flower sellers and professors of linguistics did. Benny doesn't create an air of authority like the Seventh Doctor often does, making her someone that's even easier to disregard than the funny little man with the weird umbrella. And part of this totally has to do with Benny being a woman. This aspect is amplified by the book's setting and genre. When you have a Victorian Jack the Ripper serial killer slaughtering prostitute story, your go-to protagonist is almost always a male detective in the vein of Sherlock Holmes, not the working girls getting butchered. Women are victims, and victims aren't allowed agency. Yeah, I know this book technically takes place in the Edwardian area, just work with me here. And in this environment comes Benny, an intelligent, hard-drinking, very unladylike character to poke around, get her hands dirty, and try to solve this mystery, catching the men of this setting off guard. Even little Dickensian moppets can't believe that this woman could do something as manly as, say, climb a rope. Are you sure you can climb up this rope? asked Charlie doubtfully. Benny wasn't like any woman he'd ever met before, but she dressed like a lady, and he couldn't quite imagine any English gentlewoman climbing up a dirty rope. Of course I can, Charlie, she replied, and Charlie stood agog as Benny ripped off the lower half of her dress and stood there in front of him in a pair of silk bloomers. Well, don't just stand there gawping, she said. Give a lady a bunk up. Benny clambered up the rope as though she'd been doing it all her life. As soon as she reached the surface, Charlie climbed up after her. The nearest thing the book gets to the masculine heroes of Jack the Ripper stories is the Russian detective Popov, but since this plot turns out to be science fiction in nature, he has to bow out to Benny's authority on the matter. His actual narrative function is to give Benny someone to talk about the plot with and for some extra muscle during the action bits. Essentially, he's Benny's companion, which brings back comparisons with the Doctor. Benny is very unlike the Doctor of the Virgin New Adventures, but she isn't unlike the Doctor in a more general sense. It's important to remember that this chess master superhero characterization of the Doctor was still very new, and traditionally the Doctor has been more improvisational, easily underestimated and affably charming than how Virgin has characterized him. Professor Bernice Summerfield takes traditional traits of the Doctor and presents them in a feminine framework, which works really well. That's not to say that Benny is just the doctor gender flipped, but that a sloppy, insecure, often self-contradictory woman who isn't down with your patriarchal bullshit is more valid in being the doctor than a violent masculine type of hero. Her presence among the TARDIS crew, on top of being fun and a little unpredictable, is to be a reminder of what the doctor has been at times. A kind heart, a sharp wit, and poking their nose where it doesn't belong. So she's a bit like the doctor. She's a bit like a hard-drinking, sex-positive lady detective, and she's a bit like a Victorian adventuress. And she's a bit like everyone's really cool aunt. It's almost a no-brainer that she would lead a book on her own, which was great, because she was going to have to do that a lot once Virgin lost the actual Doctor Who license. Her half of the book is some of the most fun we've had with Benny to date. Ace doesn't fare quite as well for her part of the book. Having been effectively rebooted into a new character, Birthright can be of a service to new Ace in the same way it is for Benny, but it doesn't really have a lot of stuff for her to do, almost nothing to really work off of. The rainy streets of 1900s London is a lot more dynamic than just desert wasteland. Benny gets to meet a lot of over-the-top characters from gross cultists to street pickpockets and cockney prostitutes, while Ace just has a bunch of dull cave people to whip into an army. She doesn't even, like, help them make weapons and really empower them in any way. There'd be a story in that. 
either one about the oppressed rising against the oppressor, which would justify New Ace, or one about violence being introduced into a non-violent society, one that's critical of New Ace. But they don't go with either. She just goes, look, I'm the only one here with an actual space gun, I'll take the lead, you guys cover my back, and that's pretty much it. This is the most Aces embody the badass action woman role that has been getting traction over the last decade or so. Her visual resemblance to Sarah Connor in Terminator 2 Judgment Day is completed by putting her in a dusty desert environment, and her attack on the Charl Hive is basically Ellen Ripley descending into the Xenomorph lair in the final act of Aliens. The badass action woman is known as a character that sheds away traditional preconceived feminine traits to take a role often associated by masculine action stars. This is actually less true than most people realize in both Aliens and Terminator 2. Both films are actually pretty critical of images of male machismo, but it's pretty true in the general pop culture sense, and New Ace slots in this trope pretty nicely. Like lightning, Ace shot up a leg, hitting Siva's arm. The gun went flying from his grasp, and before he could reach for it, Ace had leapt from her seated position and had thrown herself onto the older man, knocking him to the ground. They rolled around in the dirt, first one gaining the upper hand, then the other. Ace punched Siva in the gut, scarcely winding him, and Siva responded with a vicious blow to the jaw. The rest of the Harrys stood around ineffectually, watching the fight. After they'd been struggling for a few minutes, Ace managed to roll herself on top of Siba. She began pummeling his face. Put up a shut up, Siba, she growled and smashed his head brutally to the ground. We don't want your kind around here anymore. She smashed his head to the ground a second time. A charitable reading would point out that Ace is a masculine opposite to Benny's more feminine heroism, and if Benny is a visage of the Doctor's previous characterizations, that would put Ace as the Doctor's potential future characterization, moving from blowing up planets through crafty manipulation to just blowing up planets, full stop. When Benny and Ace finally reunite in the book's final act, they are so opposed in characterization that they don't trust each other, even though they've been crewmates for a few books now. Without the Doctor to act as a bridge between the two of them, they're just too far apart on the Doctor Who, gun frock, masculine feminine line. That's the charitable reading, and the one I would recommend. Really, it's more that Nigel Robinson had a lot more fun writing Benny than he did Ace. Benny is a sheer joy to write for. Mature, witty, a little self-indulgent, and at times wonderfully naive. As most of Birthright is set in 1909, it was great fun to have her trying to adapt to the customs of Edwardian London. Ace? Well, Ace I'm not too sure about. The new, tougher Ace is certainly a logical progression of the old, angst-ridden teenager, but I'm still unsure how the Doctor would accept her back on board the TARDIS. When Nigel Robinson wrote Time Warm Apocalypse, which was only the third Virgin New Adventure published, the series hadn't really found its footing yet. What direction would the books take the Doctor? How would the companions change? What kind of stories would readers gravitate towards? Back then, Robinson, who had been a writer and editor for the Target Doctor Who novelization line, played things safe with a fairly generic characterization of the Doctor and a fairly generic false utopia plot that could have worked in any era of the franchise. It wasn't bad, not at all, just incredibly safe. Oh, what a year and a half can bring. The Robinson of Birthright is so down to play in the Virgin New Adventures toy box, so willing to engage with the Puppet Master 7th Doctor, so eager to write for Benny. He's hyper. He's pumped. Hey, 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 Paul. Hey, Paul, what are, you, what, are you, what are you doing over there? What are you doing over there, Paul? Oh, 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 a companion slipped into a metaphorical dream zone that explores the interpersonal relationships between the main uh, the main characters in the show's history. Oh, that's really cool, Paul. That's really cool. I think I'm going to do that too, Paul. Yeah, Paul, I'm going to do that too, Paul. Yeah, the back end of the book has chapters where Benny interfaces with the TARDIS's psychic circuits, and it pans out like diet timeworm revelation. Things flow so about here, remarked a passing wolf who was rowing a tiny corkle through the heather-covered ground, seemingly with a total disregard for any of the normal laws of physics. The wolf moored his boat close to Benny. Hello, Mr. Wolf, Benny said warily. After all, even she had heard the story of Red Riding Hood. You don't trust me, do you? growled the wolf. Not half. The wolf tut-tutted. I suppose I'll have to change again then, he complained. 
and before Benny's eyes, he transformed himself into a lamb. There, is that better? He bleated. Benny agreed that it was. A lamb in wolf's clothing, that's what I am, giggled the lamb in a distinctly feminine voice. Two for the price of one, Benny, two for the price of one. Never judge by appearances, Professor Summerfield. Yeah, the metaphors aren't nearly as refined, and even with multiple chapters devoted to Benny's actions inside the TARDIS's mind, nothing actually gets accomplished. It doesn't move the plot forward any, or really say anything interesting about the characters. It's actually the weakest part of the book. But I think it shows just how excited Robinson got to be working with Virgin New Adventures again. Birthright was a book he had genuine interest and investment in, especially the Edwardian setting and getting to write Benny as a character. The Edwardian period interested me too. That time just before the First World War was an era of incredible change, where the old traditions mixed very uncomfortably with the new. The motor car and the telephone and the airplane had just appeared on the technological scene. On the other hand, people still believed in imps and demons. It's an ideal setting for a tale which mixes magic with science fiction. In 1911, the British Empire still believed it was the greatest power the world had ever known. It took the slaughter of the First World War to force them to change their minds. The British of 1911 were very much like the Charl, in fact. They arrogantly believed themselves to be the noblest power in the universe, and they certainly achieved some great things. But just as they had to call in the help of the USA in 1917, so the Charl had to rely on a mere mammal such as Moldwitch for their survival. Don't get me wrong, Birthright is in no way a metaphor for the destruction of the British Empire, but there are parallels between the Charl and whichever human race might at any time rule the waves. Robinson's excited interest and investment in the story can really be felt. It pops in a way that Time Worm Apocalypse didn't. You would think this would mean interest in doing more books for Virgin, and in fact, he was working on ideas for a third book as late as 1995. I'm hoping to do another new and or missing adventure, and I'm working on a couple of ideas at the moment. I'm particularly keen on stories set in the past. Given that the TARDIS is a time machine, I feel that few writers take advantage of the fact that it can go backwards as well as forwards in time. I can't see myself ever leaving Who, at least not by choice. To be totally cliche and unoriginal is just like a big family with all the traumas, joys, and disasters every family has. For whatever reason, these ideas never panned out, and Robinson did leave Who and Birthright would prove to be Nigel Robinson's final Doctor Who book. Though not his final book. The mid-90s proved to be a pretty busy time for Robinson. Between 1993 and 1997, he wrote novelizations for four episodes of Baywatch, four episodes of the 90s Tomorrow People, four for the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles, seven entries in the Horror High series of teen horror books, and finally an original three-book series called First Contact. This is a lot of words for a four-year span. That work seemed to dry up into the 21st century. In 2005, Robinson went back to his roots as a quiz book writer with an unofficial quiz book for the Chronicles of Narnia, just in time for Disney's adaptation of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Robinson did eventually return to Doctor Who in 2009 in the form of Big Finish. Nothing in the main series, but a couple of companion chronicles, and he helped adapt three scripts for the Lost Stories. His most recent work with Big Finish was in 2015. These days, Robinson's main job has been as the editor of Pride Life, a British gay lifestyle magazine. Now, since I'm talking about them, I'd be remiss not to mention that Birthright got a Big Finish adaptation in 1999. I haven't listened to it because I'm not made of money, but I can say that it's a greatly altered version of the story. Ace has been replaced with Jason Kane, an inferior character whose presence placed this version much further down Benny's timeline. Moldwitch is written out entirely, as is most of the Seventh Doctor's chess master influence, removing its tie to Iceberg. So, no, this isn't a proper book on tape. But Colin Baker plays Popoff, so that's cool. And what of the Doctor's influence in this story? Again, the Doctor is a no-show until the very last few pages, which allows Benny and Ace to take center stage, but also let us see just how far the Doctor's influence extends. It's in his absence that the Doctor is mostly felt. As they left, Benny allowed herself one self-indulgent look behind her. Not the place where Margaret's coffin had been laid, but at the wreath of white lilies which had been sent by an absent mourner. 
a mourner whose identity was unknown to everyone but she. And how far in advance did you order those flowers, doctor? Benny thought bitterly. So many deaths, so many people who made the mistake of crossing your path and trusting you. So many people who will never return home anymore. Those names I hear you mutter sometimes when you think I'm not listening. Adric, Sarah, Katerina. The ones Ace has told me about. Soren, Julian, and Raphael. And the others. All those inhabitants of the Seven Planets. So many deaths, Doctor. But tell me, just how many funerals have you actually bothered to turn up to? Actually, to say the Doctor's absent from Birthright isn't true at all. He is there, in spirit, on every page, always manipulating people, pulling strings from behind the scenes. I've always been fascinated by the betrayal of the Seventh Doctor, as an alien being of slightly dubious morals who isn't to be trusted. He travels in time, in the past and in the future. If he knows what's going to happen, how much can he then manipulate actions to his own ends? The events in Birthright couldn't have happened without the Doctor. Perhaps he planned them all along. And if he did, then there's no need for him to be present as his long and well-laid plans come to fruition. The Doctor's fingerprints are all over this story, but for me the most interesting fingerprint was this. What exactly happens with the companions that don't come back home? Sometimes when people are done traveling with the Doctor, they go home. They go back to their time period. They go back to their country. London 1965! But sometimes they end up somewhere else and can't get home. And sometimes they die. What does the Doctor do for those families, if anything at all? The example this book uses is Victoria Waterfield, a companion of the second Doctor originating from 1866. After traveling for a while, she ended up settling with a family in 1968, a hundred years into her own future. In Birthright, we learn that the Seventh Doctor eventually met back up with Victoria, took her back in time for a short period to manage her family fortune, and convinced her only living relative, her Aunt Margaret, that she would be traveling the world and may never come back. But please, Leave the estate intact so that my friend the doctor may crash here whenever he's in town and maybe let his friends stay here from time to time and we could put some of the family money into a bank account he could access, right? That would be great. Well, doctor, I have to say I'm impressed, Benny thought wryly. Poor Margaret doesn't even know that her brother, Edward Waterfield, was murdered on an alien planet and that her niece traveled with you for a while before settling down in this planet's future. A few trips in the TARDIS to selected points in history, a few pre-written letters posted at intervals from another country, and there might be tears, but there'll be no questions asked. Got it all wrapped up neatly, haven't you? No sudden disappearances, no problems with the authorities, just one tidy tying up of loose ends. Do you do that for all the people you abduct, I wonder? What's interesting about this is that the implication is that these are things the Seventh Doctor is doing specifically, not something the Second Doctor thought to do when Victoria left him in the first place. Okay, in fairness, the Second Doctor didn't have full control of the TARDIS back then, but once he did, he never went back for her until now. Not until he realized he could use Victoria to grant the Doctor useful resources and real estates. I mean, holy crap! I hope he at least asked Victoria if she wanted to go back to the 19th century. But then which is worse? That the Doctor didn't go back for Victoria until it was useful to him? Or that the incarnations before the Seventh Doctor didn't go back for Victoria at all? This book raises a lot of very uncomfortable questions about how the Doctor sees other people, how much he cares for his companions, and about the human race in general, and embraces the fact that even if he does care, he still holds a feeling of superiority over just about everyone around him. He cares enough to send flowers to a funeral, but he's too busy to show up. Where does the Doctor go from there? Exactly what path is the Doctor currently walking? The book has an answer for that in the form of Moldwitch, the hermit in the mountains existing the Charl of Void Extinction. It's clear from page one that Moldwitch is meant to have some parallel to the Doctor. He knows more than he's saying, he's long lived, and seems to have some ideas to what the TARDIS is. After meeting him, Ace assumes Moldwitch is a Time Lord, and she's correct, but she's not going far enough. No, Moldwitch is a future incarnation of the Doctor. 
How far into the future isn't elaborated on, how many regenerations in is unknown, but he is the Doctor. His TARDIS is gone, he's exiled to a dead rock of a planet for hundreds of years, he has no friends, no companions. He's all alone in a hut in the mountain. Doctor Who has played around with implying the existence of other incarnations of the Doctor outside of the main narrative. One of the earliest examples came in The Brain of Morbius, where a device displayed what seemed to be unseen past incarnations predating William Hartnell's first Doctor, though this had to be soon retconned with the introduction of the Time Lords Get 12 Regenerations rule. Then there was the Valyard, which was originally written as a future Doctor Gone Bad, though John Nathan Turner didn't like this and now he's more of an amalgamation of all the Doctor's dark traits extracted and personified or something. The Eighth Doctor Adventures introduced a future red-haired incarnation near the end of the Doctor's life. We'll talk more about him in about 12 years, but if you're wondering why the Doctor often wonders if this regeneration will make him ginger, well, there you go. The most well-known example in New Who is the War Doctor, the incarnation between the Eighth and Ninth Doctor who fought during the Time War, an incarnation the Doctor was so ashamed of that he tried to hide it. Then there's the Curator, a presumably retired Doctor that has returned to the form of Tom Baker. Oh, and the other. Let's not forget the other. And finally, there's Merlin. In the Seventh Doctor story Battlefield, small armies from a dimension where their theory and legends were real find conflict in our world, and the Doctor is recognized as the figure of Merlin the Wizard. The Doctor isn't really sure what they're talking about, but accepts the possibility that a future version of him will take on the Merlin mantle. Are you Merlin? No. But I could be. In the future. That is my personal future. Which could be the past. Right. This was a rare time where another incarnation of the Doctor was brought up, but never seen. Well, say hi to Merlin, everybody. Okay, okay, let me be clear here. Birthright only tells us that Moldwitch is a future Doctor. It would be a later book, specifically Happy Endings by Paul Cornell, that would make the connection between Moldwitch and Merlin. And really, that connection doesn't mean all that much at the end, just condensing two future incarnations of the Doctor into one. But it does tie this weird legacy of other Doctors into each other. Why do this? A lot of these Doctors will never see. We're never going to get to the Curator because Tom Baker is 84 years old and we're a long way off from the Doctor retiring. We would never have seen the faces from Brain of Morbius because those faces were members of the production staff and not actors who would play the role in some weird prequel series. And we'll never get to Moldwitch because he's an obscure character in a Doctor Who spin-off novel and the rights to him are probably owned by Robinson. But if we're not actually getting to these Doctors, what's the point of them? Well, it makes the Doctor that much more undefinable and mysterious. We're never going to see the pre-Hartnell Doctors, making the Doctor's past unknowable. We're never going to see the Doctor become the curator and retire, so the Doctor's future is unreachable. Same with Moldwitch. We'll never get to the point where the Doctor gets exiled and changes his name. The story of Doctor Who is set up so that its ending is impossible. More specifically, Moldwitch is a reflection of what the Doctor has been becoming lately. Much in the same way that the Valyard was a confrontation of the arrogance and violence of the Sixth Doctor, Moldwitch is a confrontation of the Seventh Doctor's assumed superiority over everyone and the way he pushes people away from him. Moldwitch is even introduced manipulating the Queen of the Charl. Left alone, once more, in his hut, Moldwitch smiled a self-satisfied smile and rubbed his hands with glee, scarcely able to contain his joy. He had convinced the Queen that she was in charge, that he was following her orders and not the other way around. He was really most extraordinarily good at manipulating people, he thought. At long last his carefully laid scheme was coming to fruition, and... If it helped the Charl also, then all well and good. Moldwitch isn't the evil doctor like the Valyard, but he's amoral, selfish, unconcerned with the lives of smaller creatures, and as such, he's the doctor no longer. Birthright is sloppy in many places. Sometimes the pacing gets too fast and we jump to new scenes and locations way too quickly. The A stuff isn't nearly as imaginative as the Benny stuff. Her supporting cast is weak and the action isn't all that great. 
Benny connecting to the TARDIS and spending a few chapters just wandering around Alice in Wonderland without getting anything done was a waste of space. The ending feels rushed. The actual way they save the day is weird and not set up properly, and there's a handful of typos and errors that should have been caught in the editing stage. And you know what? I don't care. Birthright is a weird, beautiful mess of a book, one that sells Bernice Summerfield as a story lead and explores some really uncomfortable aspects of the Doctor in his absence, all the while giving us a twisting, unfilmable science fiction story that mashes up Jack the Ripper mysteries with James Cameron action films. Time Worm Apocalypse was a very safe book from Robinson. Birthright is anything but, and I highly recommend it. Next time, we find out what the hell the Doctor was doing this whole time, and we get the return of an iconic Doctor Who villain for the first time in The Virgin New Adventures.